Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webcast, The Great AI-Powered Comeback, Becoming an AI-Powered Version of Yourself. This webcast has been pre-approved for HRCI and SHRM credit. Please be sure to attend the complete webcast in order to receive your credits. If you have any questions during the webcast, click on the Q&A tab in your webinar controls and type them there. A new tab will open in your browser with the webcast survey. Please be sure to complete it as soon as the webcast is ended. It is now my pleasure to turn it over to Fiona Passantino for their presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hester, and welcome to everybody. Uh, I am logging in from the Netherlands, from The Hague. It's beautiful here. I can't speak much for the beautiful weather. It's raining, as always, but um, very nice to, uh, to be joining today. And if you happen to be logging in from a city or um, a county, please uh, put in your city where you're logging in from. It's always really fun to see where people are coming in from. So I will, um, ah, lovely Portland, Maine, beautiful. I'm going to give a few minutes for people to get settled in because I know we are all back to back all day long. Oh my goodness, look at this, Washington, D.C., Kansas, Denver, Orange County, Atlanta, GA, that's where my mother lives. Wonderful. Stone Mountain, fantastic. Annapolis, Charleston, lots of Atlantans. Are anybody joining from another country? Let's see, silence. Fort Worth, close. <laughs> nice, great, very good. Charleston, again, Fayetteville, Wichita. Excellent. Well, welcome, welcome, everybody. I am here um, as a kind of a recent AI-powered professional myself. I also experienced a setback some years back. Uh, seems like a long time ago now since so much has happened. And I can tell you that the world looks very bright after one of these things happens to you. It's sort of like the universe is paving a different path for you. And, uh, and it's up to us to just follow it where it leads. So to start out with, we're going to be running about 90 minutes. We will be uh, having two polls in this. So there'll be two times during the course of this presentation that uh, we're going to be kind of stopping the show and taking a poll. That's just for fun, no requirement. Uh, I don't believe there's a certification attached to whether you participate or not, but it's really nice. It's really fun to see where your heads are at. Um, I see somebody coming in from Lagos, Nigeria. Fantastic. That is great. And somebody from another planet. That's great. You win the far away prize. It, just let us know what planet that is. Um, if you have a question, we are very happy to stop the show and listen because this is an interactive session. We will have to uh, pipe you in separately so you can be part of the voice part of this. So don't hesitate at all if you have a burning question. Otherwise, we will open this up again at the end. You can also put in your questions in the chat. Hester will be kindly um, collecting these for a little bit later on in the show. And I would love to encourage people to join the hr.com March 8th long day session uh, for women's leadership. Lots of speakers, wonderful events there, and um, that chat. Uh, that link will be put in the chat as well. So without further ado, we're going to um, to get started on today's topic. Basically, whether you've had a setback that you can quantify or not, things don't always go the way we want in our professional careers. This can be something dramatic like a layoff or a reorganization. Reorgs are now becoming almost annual events for large organizations. And they happen now almost with regularity. People breathe in and they breathe out employees. And if you are on the good side of a reorg or a bad side of the reorg, it's extremely disruptive, uh, extremely difficult uh, for the team. It could be that you are one of the staying players, but that your role is dramatically altered. It could be that your workload has doubled because there are people missing from your team all of a sudden and you're the only one to do it. So either way, a reorg or um, a massive layoff has massive impact for the people who are left behind. It could be that you are a freelancer and you have your own business and you see a sudden drying up of your client 
cool. This uh, happens as well. You realize your old job, whatever you defined it as, is not coming back. It's now a definitely um, a new world. This has huge impact for your finances. It impacts how you see your future, your plans. It might even cause you to redefine who you are. You may experience a real dip in your motivation or your place in the world. You might even be reconsidering your purpose. This might be something you've done for quite some time. And now suddenly you need to uh, reconsider what it is you're doing. Now, a lot of you hear a lot of things. I've heard this, uh, this, this disruption syndrome has happened to me a few times in my life. And um, I've always done, been kind of puzzled when I've heard this advice. Don't take it personally. It's not about you. Usually that advice comes from my HRBP. Um, big shout out to all HR people. This is so hard for HR professionals. I really appreciate what you go through. Nobody likes doing it. And it shows that uh, the the level of of personal sort of stress in your life as an HR uh, professional, having to share this bad news really impacts your stress levels and your own motivation. So I I, I get it. This is not a role anybody wants to do. And um, uh, HR people do mean very well when they say uh, it's not about you, but it sort of is about you because this person, if it's you or if it's somebody that you recently had to share bad news with, it's this is a person who was let go. Not everybody was let go, but this particular person was let go. So on some level, it is personal. The company, the client is saying, we don't need you. We can go on without you. Um, the, the company has chosen this. The company will live on without you. And, and this is an extremely hard thing to take. It really, really takes some time to get used to the idea. And then you have to go through this process of psychologically withdrawing and, and um, detaching from your current role. Uh, so wh whether you believe it or not, it is personal. And on many levels, it is about you. The good news, though, is that uh, none of us are alone in all this. Uh, the last year and this coming year is going to see a lot of AI disruption. What does that mean? It means that these generative tools, and they're not just GTP or text generative tools, we're talking multimodality AI generative tools. And by modality, I mean text, image, video, voice, music, all of these different tools that work together that all together can mimic and replace a lot of the tasks that we do as people. So about 40% of all of our working hours can already now be disrupted or impacted by AI. The truth is we just don't need to do all of these things by hand anymore. 62% of everything we do is very much language related. What does that mean? It means communicating, reading and writing, uh, uh, brainstorming in a, in a semantic way. And because these are text generative tools, AI has basically broken our human platform, which is language. And that's why so much of our work is being disrupted by AI. It seems that about 44% of companies are experiencing quite large scale, massive AI related layoffs, which means that they are reassessing where they're allocating their funds and their personnel, and they are trimming down in a, in a very big way. It looks like one person can do the job of four, so we don't need those other three. The ones that are really AI powered are the ones that remain, the ones that will not or cannot, or just don't seem to get it together to adapt and take on these tools are the ones that oftentimes are being left behind out of this process. Um, it also applies very much to freelancers. Freelancers are being replaced by in-house people. You don't need to hire the people who are writing your annual reports. You don't need to hire the external illustrator anymore to illustrate your onboarding materials, for instance. So we are experiencing a double job loss, both with companies and with freelancers. So 
what like I said before, the the human operating system is language, and that is across all different languages. It's given us the power to be multilingual in a moment when we were not before. So one person will have the ability to speak to, you know, 40 different nationalities that are working in your organization, whereas before this had to be outsourced or using people on the ground and so on. And these layoffs, uh, it seems like it's going to be accelerating in the coming quarter two, quarter three of 2024. That's when they say that it's may likely peak out and that things will kind of renormalize as we all gain these um, these skills. The even better news is that um, most of us do find work pretty soon after we start looking. So usually within about three months. This is longer if you choose to change your industry, change what you do and change how you uh, are doing it. And I suspect if you are making a leap into becoming that AI powered version of yourself, that it will probably also be longer. It also means that most people, the majority of people will receive a, um, a higher salary than before. If you come back into the workforce as an AI powered version of yourself, you will find that there is higher demand for this than your original, let's say, iteration in just about every sector of the economy. It doesn't really matter. Also HR, by the way, just specifically HR. There's some amazing tools that are coming online. There are amazing new challenges uh, that are coming um, to, to bite us uh, in this field as well. But in general, if you understand the brain of the AI and how it works, then you will have an easier time adapting and choosing the tools that will suit you. So my name is Fiona Passantino. For those of you who are joining late, um, I am a speaker, I'm a coach, I write books, I make comic books about AI, which is a lot of the stuff that you see. I have a layering technique, so I'm now AI powered as an artist uh, and as an author because I just don't have time to draw all the nitty gritty backgrounds to all of these little comics. Um, I use them very much for education. And so AI is helping me with that. I also have a podcast, which can be, if I choose, available in every single language on earth. I choose to stick with English because I'm just lazy that way. Uh, but anyway, it, all of these things that I do are possible because AI has given me um, a little bit of extra power. So um, I have this podcast that I put out every couple of weeks, which deals with um, the human workforce and how AI impacts us. And then I'm also writing a book called AI Power that's coming out a little bit later on this year. The new thing that I'm taking on is stand-up comedy, which is a tool that I'm weaving into a lot of my talks. It seems like AI is scary for a lot of us and using comedy, using these techniques is a great way to get people laughing try to enjoy the process of learning and uh, and focus on the fun instead of the awful of AI. Basically, uh, we all know that AI is here. Um, this is a non-human intelligence that we are building just as fast as we can. There seem to be no holds uh, barred on this one. Um, there is the uh, what we call the great... Um, competition excuse, which is if we don't do it, someone else will. So uh, all these other countries, China, um, Japan, um, France is a great player in this. The Nordics are really playing uh, very hard. Even Italy is becoming quite a big player in generative AI development. So if we don't do it, then somebody else will. We seem to be all on track for AGI, which is uh, artificial general intelligence. Um, I'll be getting into a bit more of that later. And whatever we feel about it, it is here. And what I tend to tell people to do when I start off is to um, take all this emotion and energy that we have about how we feel about AI. What do we feel about it? What do we think about it? And try to channel it into learning the tools as quickly as possible. Yes, it's scary. And I find myself also lying awake once in a while and saying, hey, gosh, this is, is this going in the way that I want it to go? I don't know. Um, but then turning that energy into learning about it uh, quickly, it really helps me um, a lot. So um, we start with 
a little look on about how this thing works. How does AI work? AI is here to do one of three things. And I'm gonna pause at the end of this slide to do a little poll so we can catch our breath a little bit before we dive into the real technical stuff. In general, AI is, do, is, is going to help us in three ways. It's here to analyze and predict, it's here to analyze and create, and it's here to analyze and recommend. Those are the three basic use cases for AI. And we split this up into 100 different tasks and 100 different ways of uh, supporting those tasks. But those are the three basic things that AI does well. It's really, really good at taking massive amounts of data and finding patterns and telling you what those patterns are and telling you what the data is telling you. It's very, very good at taking large amounts of text, language, condensing them, tokenizing them, ripping them apart and reassembling them in ways that are cogent and interesting based on probability. And we'll explain a little bit more later. But those, if we look at those three things that AI does very, very well, then we understand what of our own workflows work best. All right, so Hester, I'm gonna ask you to release the Kraken. If you can please put in, yeah, look at that, wow. The first poll. So how do you use AI at work? I hope people can see this. I am not allowed to vote, so all I can do is just listen and learn. We're gonna have this going on in the background and I'm gonna go on for a little while, allow you guys time to think about what this is. It's perfectly fine if you don't use AI at work. That's why we're here. We're here to uh, to get our feet wet in this one. So I'm going to just move this guy out of the way and let you guys work on that. And then Hester, I'm going to ask you in a in a in about two slides down how we're doing with these with the poll and and see what our biggest group is. All right, so we're going to dive into how AI works. Okay. Oops. Sorry. Looks like I am having some technical difficulties here. We're going to start with an algorithm. What is an algorithm? We throw this term around a lot. This is the basic hard-coded brain of the AI. This is this so, uh, collection of code that you see. It's about 4,000 lines of code for uh, a GTP. This is small enough to run on your phone. It's not a lot of code. And this is the set of instructions that allows the AI to make decisions and to understand what your intent, your user intent would be. It allows uh, AI to solve um, specific tasks, make decisions based on what we call an AI constitution which is this kind of rule uh, that directs its alignment. And we're going to explain all these terms coming up. So that's the algorithm. And the analogy that I like to make with an algorithm is when you think of a newborn child, a newborn child is born with an, a specific a bit of intelligence. We know that when a baby cries, that the baby is fed or the baby is changed. This baby knows what to do before it's born. So this is this kind of hardwired intelligence, no schooling required. Baby knows, I cry, I get stuff, I get what I need. So that's the algorithm. Next, we have the second layer. If you think of that baby, the baby grows up, the baby goes to school, the baby gets a set of instructions from training. Parameters are the part of the model, the large language model, that form a kind of school. Large language models are not just released after development. They have to spend some time in school. They get trained. They get human trained. So they're given a series of prompts. They are allowed to experiment and create these decisions. The human in the loop is going to give them one of two things, either a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And based on that, they're going to give themselves a check mark and that will train them what is the desired answer. And after a few months of this, they're ready to be released into the wild. And, and last one before I get that poll out, the final layer of a child's development is 
life experience. So you have your born intelligence, you have your schooling, and then you have what you experience in the real world that allows you to make decisions. If I open a jar of peanut butter and I stick my fingers in, what happens, right? This is how a child learns. Uh, if I put my finger on a stove and it's on, it can be hot. And this is based on our life experience. This is what we call a weight. A weight is a value between zero and 100 that is attached to a certain decision of the um, uh, of the AI. So what does this mean? A weight will be a larger number if the source is more believable. Let's say you have the New York Times versus um, the um, underground uh, gopher press. I don't know. We will assign a higher weight to the New York Times as far as a source that number will be higher than the underground gopher press. So that is the way that we tell an AI or that the AI will actually tell itself that this source has a better reputation. Uh, it means more than the other one. And that's how it gets better and better at what it does. The interesting thing about a weight is that this is something that the AI does for itself. It rewrites its own code so that it takes its life experience and it retroactively applies it to its own brain. Uh, I wish I could do that myself, um, but this is how AIs get better over time, even after they've been trained and released uh, into the wild. So Hester, I'm gonna pause it right here and see um, whether there are some polling results. Oh, fantastic. So most of you looks like are using it to automate tasks. That's wonderful. Boosting creativity, I'm very, very happy to see that too, because a lot of people think that AI is this kind of techie thing that is not creative at all, that the humans are the sole purveyors of creativity. And I'm so happy to see that you're using it in a creative way. Uh, that's great. So 27% of you there. Uh, only 1% of you is using it to make decisions. That's very interesting because it it's one of its great strengths is to make recommendations. So what I can urge you to do, if you're using a GTP or a Gemini or a Copilot, to start using it to help you make better decisions. For instance, if you take a large amount of text, like a giant PDF, and you need to make a decision as to what to do next based on this massive report that was handed to you that you're supposed to read and you know, understand within two hours, you can feed this, you can upload this into a large language model and say, give me a few recommendations based on this text, what I should ask at the next shareholders meeting. For instance, these kinds of things more and more are showing us just variations of uh, how to use this to guide our decision making. We see this very much in the medical um, field. People are uh, doctors, specifically nurses as well, are using AI advice based on the data for their own, um, th the way they interact with their own patients and diagnose illnesses. Some of this is um, better than others. Uh, visual diagnoses are, are becoming better and better. Um, we're seeing a lot of uh, long distance diagnoses based on AI. And of course, we're all through COVID, thankfully, uh, thanks to AI's uh, decision-making recommendations with our vaccines. So that's that. 27% um, of you have not thought about it all. Totally fine. Totally fine. I was there with you one year ago. <laughs> I was uh, I was trained in this stuff, but I never really thought about how to use it in my daily work until, um, you know, literally about a year ago. So uh, absolutely no problem. And you, uh, by the way, uh, don't even have to do it after this session either. It's it's totally up to you. So we're going to march forward into our foray into uh, the AI brain. All right. Okay, so sorry about this. Just going to have this go forward. Sorry, it seems like we're having a little technical difficulty here. Um, Hester, I'm going to stop sharing and reshare again because it looks like I've frozen something. 
So I'm try, one. Oh, I was going to say, try using your arrow keys to see if it'll go with the arrow keys. But... Yeah, I have. I okay. have done. done. <laughs> so yeah, sometimes this happens. Here we go. Yeah, no, this is also not um, not advancing. Let's see here. Ah, there we go. Perfect. Sorry about the delay, everybody. This is a model loose in the machine here. So how does the AI feed? What is it eating? What is it digesting in order to have this kind of intelligence? It feeds off data, lots and lots and lots of it. And what is data? Data is our human communication. So this takes the form of our websites, our images, photography, our papers, texts, documents, emails, posts, you name it. Think about who are the main players in AI. Who is creating these giant, giant language models? You have obviously OpenAI. They're a standalone creature. They're quite amazing. But the other players are Google, for instance. You have Meta. You have XAI, which is... Um, formerly known as Twitter. <laughs> Twitter is X now, and XAI is a branch uh, off of the Elon Musk um, uh, diaspora, let's call it. What do these things all have in common? Amazon, by the way, is working on a massive uh, new language model that they are codenaming Olympus. We'll see if it comes out. That's kind of a secret. Nobody is really talking about. What do all of these things have in common? They have access to massive amounts of human written data. So when it comes to X, uh, they have a lot of Twitter feed. Uh, when it comes to Google, they have a lot of Google Docs. They have a lot of email traffic that they randomize, that they tokenize, that they make anonymous, but they use to train their models. So what an AI needs to learn is a lot of human written data. Now, why did why is AI so powerful now? What is it about the environment that has changed that has made it so powerful? So here's what we look at for our da basic data landscape. This is just a few years ago. AI started to really come online in a commercial way somewhere around um, the beginning of the 20s. And it never really got off the ground until about two years ago. Two years ago was the very first time that uh, ChatGTP was um, put out into the world. But then what happened to our data landscape since then? It has really exploded. So what you're looking at here in this screen is the data landscape uh, in the most recent part of our history. And it's actually expanded since then. This is only until uh, 2020 and it's going up and up. I can't show you more than this because otherwise you won't be able to read it, but it's increased even more um, in the year since. So with this explosion of data comes an explosion of intelligence. The more data that uh, a large language model has access to, the more intelligence, the more intelligent it re its reply will be. What do these numbers look like? One of the larger models is uh, known as LAMA, something like 1.4 trillion tokens. What does that mean? A token is a portion of a word or a portion of a sentence, depending on the model. Some models are uh, semantic and some are um, uh, digital. So the semantic models will take a sentence apart, split it into important word fragments, pieces of words, and each one of these is a token. And the more tokens it has access to, the smarter it is. So these are massive, massive numbers. And as our amount of data in expands in the future, the smarter these models will become. So the moral of the story is the more data you feed it, um, the faster it'll grow and the smarter it'll get. Okay, so how does it actually work? Okay, I understand that you have this big pile of data, which is all of our, you know, our emails, our, um, our interactions, our text, our articles, our documents. And then we have these very, very smart systems that give it instructions as to what to do. I understand that we have these layering of intelligence, but how does it actually make a decision? How does it know to take your prompt, gather our intent as a user, and turn that into an actual decision that makes sense? Okay. What is the task of a GTP? It's very simple. It is to finish the sentence. You start a sentence with maybe three or four words. 
based on everything that it knows, everything that it's seen in the past, it will extrapolate what is the most logical way to finish that sentence. And that's it. That's all it really does. And it's really, really good at it. But how does the brain look? If you crack open the hood of this thing, what does it look like? It's based on a decision tree. And a decision tree is a very complex mathematical formula that says, what of all these decisions open to me, of all these different words I can choose, which one, which token has the highest probability of being correct in this exact um, iteration? So what I'm showing you here is a visualization of a linear decision tree. In fact, they are layered, which means they make multiple decisions simultaneously. And these decisions are not just yes or no, they are based on all the different options available. So it's extremely complex. And that's why we have these traceability problems. We don't know how they got to this decision. That's why we call it a black box neural network. Um, this is a very fancy way of saying that the smart people who built this thing really don't know how it works because we know that all these little parameters, the, the nodes of the neural network are bouncing all of this information and data around within its system. And what spits out the other side is a very correct cogent answer, but we don't actually know how it works. What does that mean for HR professionals? Something very concrete and tangible. Your AI may very well give you advice to recommend a certain candidate for a position over other candidates. Why? The AI will not be able to tell you why. It will only tell you this candidate meets all of your requirements. This is the best candidate based on your requirements that we have out of the pool that have come to us. So that is why we have a bit of a uh, an issue, let's call it, um, where we are trusting AI AI had, is based mostly on human-based data, which is biased because humans are biased. And that's where we sometimes come into trouble. But if we understand where this comes from, then we understand, okay, we have to um, check the answers. That's what we call the human in the loop. The human has to stay part of the process. Otherwise, we have this kind of bias with us. So the black box is difficult and tricky. It's getting better. It's these things are with every iteration, it is becoming a bit more traceable, but it still has this complexity issue. Bias is baked in to the cake. And that means when you recruit somebody for a position, it's good to just go back and make sure that you can defend this decision and check what is it about this particular candidate that is better. I see a question has come up. Hester, is that a good time to pause and see what Somebody wants? Sure. It says, uh, it's from Michelle. It's, How do we know that the black box is compliant with Fed and state laws? Fantastic question. And the answer is we don't. <laughs> we don't. Because the AI has its own constitution. Uh, it's very funny. Uh, it's got this kind of sci-fi movie um, idea where the AI has this list of things that it can and can't do. Well, its constitution is based on what the makers of the AI have decided is important. This does not necessarily coincide with the state laws um, and national laws that we have uh, uh, allotted, which makes it really, really tricky. So it's a great question. The answer is no. It, it doesn't necessarily um, coincide with. There are a lot of models out there trying to prove that it does, but in the end, there's simply too much data. We don't have a way of controlling the data that the AI is exposed to, and we don't have that traceability that we need to say, yes, it is compliant with certain laws. So that is where the human uh, the human's life experience and the human AI, HR professional is going to step in and say, ho, 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 um, this actually um, is not uh, what we're looking for. Is that, is that a good answer to your question? Okay, silence. <laughs> all right, that's all I got because it, it it this is a this is a tricky one, and this is what people are um, grappling with still. So, and and I don't think there's going to be an easy answer for this in the coming, certainly not the coming year. All right, we're going to uh, move on in terms of um, traceability. There are 
indexes that track which models are the most transparent, which means that the answers are the most logical and the ones that you're able to see how did it arrive at this place. So Llama is doing very, very well. Um, Amazon is a little bit behind. OpenAI uh, is, that's the GTP, the, the granddaddy of GTP. Um, that's looking pretty good. The GTP4 is the premium version. 3.5 is not on this list for obvious reasons. It's not as high a performer as the four, but um, that's a little bit of, a, of an overview as to um, what we're looking at. One of the ones I do want to point to is Anthropic's Claude 2. Anthropic is a branch of um, ex-employees of OpenAI who decided to go out on their own and create a model that has a very rigid constitution so that it is the safest kind of model in terms of data, in terms of protection, in terms of bias that one can get. So they are working on this. They, they are not scoring very high. It's a relatively young model, but but they're one to watch. They're, they're very interesting. Okay, so we are going to pause for a moment. I think, is that another question that I see? Or, or, yes. Hester, is that a second question or is that the same hand raised? <laughs> No, it's uh, actually that's uh, Michelle did say yes, thank you. You answered her question. And this one <laughs> is would AI tell us in the future what to do to get hired? Or why is the candidate not getting a job? Yes, this is what these tools are doing already now. We are experiencing in HR this kind of red queen effect. If any of you remember Alice in Wonderland, where um, the armies at war, one army would develop one weapon and then the other one would have to immediately develop the next weapon. It was kind of like this arms race. Candidates are using AI tools like Lazy Apply that can pump out something like 10,000 applications a day. So they enter in their details, they enter in uh, their CV, and these models will twist it to apply via the... Um, uh, the hiring manager's forms, a lot of times they have these forms and it will just plug it in exactly the way they like it, create the essays, everything, just the way they like it. And um, the, how do you deal with this flood of applicants all of a sudden kind of flooding your zone? Well, um, talent acquisition uh, managers are using AI tools to sift through these piles and piles of people. What happens is, this was discovered a couple of months ago that suddenly we had this war for talent. This was basically the years 2021-2022, um, where there was such a war for talent, we were just not getting enough candidates responding to a vacancy. And then suddenly somewhere around first quarter uh, sorry, uh, fourth quarter last year, this started turning around. There started to be a whole lot more people applying for jobs. And the first thing that that we thought was, wow, uh, looks like the war for talent is over. And lo and behold, people were ghosting. They were not coming to the interviews. They were not responding to requests for more information because they weren't human. These were bots. These were not actual applicants, but these were these kind of auto-generated um, applications. And so this is this is costing a ton of time for talent acquisition. And what do you do if you suddenly have, a, by a factor of 10, number of applicants for a single um, vacancy, and they're not human, they're not responding to you, they're not even showing up to the um, the first interviews, the, the screening interviews. So this is a real quandary that, that we're working with. Um, that is a whole different uh, topic. I, I talk to HR professionals specifically on this topic, how to keep up with this, how do you deal with this? What I generally say is make a move from acquisition to talent retention, because first of all, we all know that, that acquisition is much more costly in many ways than um, keeping the people in their seats in the first place. And now with these new tools that allow us let's say, disrupted people looking for jobs to really superpower our um, application process, getting through the screening process, et cetera, then uh, it's 
even more compelling to focus, laser focus on keeping people from quitting in the first place uh, by going into engagement uh, theory. So uh, that's a whole other um, topic for another day. Uh, that's also quite fascinating. But today we're going to go back to the disruption of what happens if you experience a setback and, and what do you do? What are the steps you take? This is more from the talent perspective, more from the perspective of people who are um, looking to re-engineer themselves. So the first thing that you might do is um, take a break. It's really important to give yourself time after a setback um, to just step away, step away, step out of the entire uh, environment that you found yourself. This is a loss. And anytime you have a loss or a breakup, you need to have some time, time to really face what has happened to get out of your head and to remove yourself if you possibly can from your environment. So it, sh it shows that if you change your environment, you start to stimulate the creative process. And we will need this creative brain in a big way when we kind of repurpose ourselves, because we're going to be thinking a lot about what we truly want and where we see ourselves fitting into the future. You need to do maybe something new, uh, take on some new challenge, uh, something physical. There's a huge um, benefit to cognitive newness and emotional newness and the physical environment newness, they all kind of work together. So if you go, if you can have the opportunity to go to a different city or a different country even, and take on something entirely new, challenge yourself, learn a new skill, then this really does help taking this decompression time to sort of detach. And the next thing that I would recommend is to recast what happened to try to retell the story, not to kind of lie to yourself or to those around you, but to really take responsibility for what part did I play in what happened? Um, okay, maybe it was totally had, I. it could be that nothing happened, that I did nothing to to um, instigate this. But but there was a reason that my name came up when it was time to downsize instead of somebody else's. Do I have some of this responsibility? And then to try to understand what happened and then retell the story in a very short, simple, positive way, it's fine also to blame AI uh, if, in, if that's part of your story. I used to be a translator of books, let's say. This isn't actually what I used to do, but... Um, and then AI made it much, much more affordable for other people to translate books so they don't hire me anymore. That's a perfect explanation. So this is a new story that you're going to be telling the world, telling yourself that how what happened to you is a combination of things that you did, things that your environment did, and things that the grander, greater environment like the AI um, disruption has done. Okay, now, then it's start time to start training. What I generally say is train first and then think second as to what you're going to do. Because it's only by really understanding the tools that you can imagine yourself in a new role. Learn the basics. Learn about either generative text or multimodality, but really give yourself some training. A lot of times you have a training budget. When you have um, a transition, you get a transition budget. Some are more generous than others. And this should allow you to go to school. And there are more and more online courses, basics about AI. Then you can give yourself a budget, what is possible. You can give yourself a time span. Let's say you allow yourself two months, three months to really dive in and understand this stuff. And then as you're learning, you're also applying. You're also getting out there, seeing what's out there. You're also seeing what kinds of jobs are out there. I'm seeing just when I randomly go online to see what's out there, a sudden explosion in what people are looking for in terms of AI powered professionals. So having that AI training is good no matter what you choose to do. Here's an example. This is obviously not relevant for most of you. This is one um, uh, course that is going on. This is a, a live course um, in Holland. 
And there's so many like this. I know that LinkedIn Learning has a, an entire school that they're developing on AI. It's all online. It's very, very convenient. And um, you can kind of dive into it at your own pace and, uh, and at your own depth. After you have a little bit of a basic understanding, you can start to say, okay, I see myself here. I see myself there. These tools match who I am. And I won't need this kind of tool. I will need this kind of tool because this is this is my personality. This is where my strengths lie. And this is where my weaknesses lie. And AI will come in and make up for those weaknesses. But it's really, that's a next step. This is where some people sometimes get confused. Like, it's it's really important to first really get that training to really understand what it is before defining how you're going to fit into it. So in general, AI takes the kind of yucky, icky tasks away, the draining things, the things you really don't like to do, and augments your fun favorite things to do. You're leaning into the live human experience. You're leaning into your ability to connect, to communicate, to support one another, to lead a team, to manage, to listen. All these human-based skills are things that an AI can't really do. Yes, it can listen, but not in the way that humans need. Uh, we are still humans at work doing human things, and AI is not able to be a leader. AI is not able to really be a good human mentor. AI does not have empathy. AI is very good at giving the impression of empathy and writing highly empathetic emails, but it is not an empathetic creature that a human is. And these are the skills that we are going to need uh, going forward. And then once we've kind of separated this out, these human skills can be honed. Um, empathy is a muscle. Listening is a skill that you can learn and develop. There are things that you can do every day, very, very small practices that will augment your human abilities. So um, when you think of the creative process, how can you become more creative than you already are? This is a very classic human skill. Yes, AI is a wonderful partner in creativity. You can use it as a, um, as a sparring partner, as we call it. So helping you get to a great idea, it's a great way of using these tools. But what can you do to increase your own creativity? This is a practice of just five minutes a day. Little tiny tricks that will get you better. And this is also training. Soft skills training is everywhere. It's even easier to find on YouTube, on LinkedIn, uh, as live training classes than AI training. It's been around forever, how to be a better storyteller, how to relate to others better, how to um, be uh, more aware, uh, how to speak to people from different cultural backgrounds. All of these kinds of things. These are things that we will be much more in demand in the AI uh, powered workforce. And I'm gonna start with a couple of areas where we will see that we will need these skills. Number one is communication. Yes, GTP is a great communicator, but it's only an executor. It doesn't actually spark that communication and, and it doesn't know when it's necessary to communicate. That's the human part. Humans will have this instinct for when it's necessary to communicate, how to convey the information in a way that's clear and effective. We are going to see the live presentation, the live event, the in-person physical training or the live webinar is going to be the human realm for quite a while still. We do have talking head AI, but the issue of latency, which is the speed at which a reaction and a listening can occur online between a model and a human user is still too high, which means the lag time is too great to have a meaningful interaction with, let's say, a video talking head or a translation tool yet. It's coming, but it's not there yet. So the human is really going to be central to the communication process. I see another hand up, or is that a bubble in the chat? Hester, is this somebody who has a question or is this a comment in the chat? There's no questions in the Q&A. 
And the okay. only comment in the chat is from Michelle saying, yes, thank you to answering the question. Perfect. All right. Great. So that little ball is there to stay. Perfect. All right. So um, back to uh, this list. The next thing is our skills, our ability to be leaders. And this doesn't mean necessarily that you're going to have to have a leadership role. Leadership skills are wonderful no matter what you do. Even if you are a practitioner out in the field, embedded with clients, if you are a talent scout yourself, leadership is one of these skills. We all know it when we see it, but it, we have a very hard time defining it. This is your ability to inspire others, your ability to motivate others. This is your ability to have a vision and share it in a way that aligns others around you, behind you. This is also your ability to support a working team and create a community instead of just a bunch of collection of workers. Whether you have a team under you or not, if you're advising a leader that has a team under them, then this makes you more effective as well. Leadership is also a skill that is learned. The, the, there are practices that are ways of thinking. There are ways of exercising leadership skills. All right, let's go on. Critical thinking. This is very, very important because AI has this tendency to hallucinate. And hallucinate is this complete making up of facts that the AI is known for. This means that oftentimes the AI will generate things that don't exist, that will um, come up with facts that absolutely seem like they're coming out of nowhere. It doesn't have the ability to self-check, which means the human has to stay in the loop. Critical thinking skills are also skills that can be trained, that, uh, that augment with intuition, that shift perspective. These are all things that we need to get better and better at in the future. Okay, and here's why. If any of you have used GTP in the past, and please uh, dump into the chat, this is the fun part, where those of you who have used these tools can give examples of when a, an AI tool has hallucinated uh, in the past. One of my favorite examples is a, a, a colleague of mine who decided to um, GTP themselves and see uh, what story they they knew. And now, of course, we know that that the free version of GTP does not have access to the World Wide Web, but the premium version does. And she found out that she was dead. <laughs> According to a large language model, um, it was kind of an obituary. And she said, gosh, um, I knew I was old, but I, I didn't realize <laughs> that I had expired. So uh, if you have any of these kinds of funny examples, uh, please do share them in the chat. This is why we need to have these critical thinking skills. When we're using these models, they will very often come back with facts and information that simply are not true. We use these kinds of fancy words like hallucination, but it's just another way of saying wrong. It's just wrong. So the technical a definition of a hallucination is when one of these large language models um, generates information or facts that are completely not aligned with reality. Um, when you have a visual AI, um, you would see a lot of kind of six fingered hands or three noses or two ears um, attached to people. It's a very, very funny thing, um, but it's a hallucination. Fortunately, we have a matrix for that as well. So here we have um, a list of some of the ones that are hallucinating the least, which is really, really nice. GTP4 is uh, at the top of the list, and it goes down from there. This list is changing all the time. So um, don't, uh, don't sit on this for very long. This will change literally within a month um, if you let it. The next skill that we're going for is to increase our creativity. Humans are still the ones that are masters at generating and synthesizing fresh ideas. Uh, these language models, they're really good at taking what's existing and crunching it down and reprocessing and putting it out again. But it's really the human that has this ability to come up with something very, very new. And this is something, like I said, can be learned. Our emotional intelligence, this is something that we will need more and more of in the future as well. So our ability to understand emotions in others, to bridge cultural divides, 
to take on diversity and make diverse teams work is is uh, something that will be more and more in demand as AI takes on the kind of boring rote tasks. All right, I'm going to pause here for a moment. And Hester, maybe this is a time to do our second poll. All right, look at that, here we go. If for those of you who are not able to see for whatever reason, if you're looking at this on your phone, let's say, uh, what worries you about relying too much on AI? And the answers are losing the human touch, privacy concerns, over-dependence on AI, or keeping up with the tech. And the keeping up tech, I can definitely relate to that. I spend about a day a week just reading, getting informed about all this stuff because it's very overwhelming. So I'll give you a moment to to think about that. Uh, someone has asked in the in the Q and A also if you can share the sources of the metrics. I believe it's the hallucination rates and accuracy ones. Yes, absolutely. These slides are uh, in PDF form and they are uh, available, I believe, Hester, to download from the site and all the sources should be listed on every single slide. What I can also do is upload it onto the area. Usually you can see it. I have it in tiny, tiny letters, but I suspect it's too small to read at the bottom of the screen. But um, the uh, the original slides will have it on there and I will make sure um, that uh that they are in a digital format as well for people to link to. I'm just posting a link to the ones on the site. Okay, great. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Thank you for that. Any others? I see a whole bunch of chats coming in. Hester, do you have yes. any there? Yes, on your question about uh, having fun with GPT doing things. So yes. one said, AI is like my dad. If he doesn't know something, <laughs> he makes something up, but tells people with such conviction that they believe it. That's and... so great. Thank you. That's beautiful. Perfect. And All the right. other one, another one was, uh, I once told GPT, don't hallucinate. And it replied, I'm an AI language model. I can't hallucinate like a human can. <laughs> right. That's great. Thank you for those. Any others? Uh, not at the moment. Somebody just asked, Katie asked if why there wasn't an all of the above option for the poll. <laughs> Excellent point. Yes, I will think of that. And what a great point. Absolutely. Yeah. And and now that you say that, I would actually probably check that box. So so thanks for that. All right. Any others in there before we uh, move on? No, nope, that's it for now. And okay, it looks perfect. like pretty much everybody is finished with the poll. So if you want to okay. go for that, hang on a sec. Let's see that result. Okay, so the results are in. But about about losing the human touch came in at um, looks like no. I'm sorry. Privacy concerns are number one at thirty nine percent. Agree. This is really uh, a difficult one. Privacy is the protection of your own data and personal data of others. And one of the problems that we have is the data that we're using. Everything that you enter into a prompt window is no longer yours. So it will find its way to a server somewhere uh, in hovering around Silicon Valley, and it is out of your control. What I tend to tell companies is to download a foundational model, install it behind your firewall, and then use proprietal data within behind your firewall so that that the use of your, let's say, your language model is as safe as your data is and as good as your firewall. Now, if your firewall is awful, then maybe this isn't the best solution, but this is the best that I can tell you. Anything that you enter into a prompt window, this is really important. Anything you enter into a prompt window is no longer yours. It is off the reservation. And what models do is they use the prompts, they use the input that you put in as material to train the models. So whatever, you know, this is what I tell my daughter uh, when she's using her Instagram, um, be totally comfortable with everything that you post being viral all around the world. So whatever photo you post, make sure that you're totally okay with everybody in the entire world seeing it. And that's what I tell people as well. If you have 
uh, data that you are entering into a prompt window, make sure that you are totally okay with it winding up somewhere else in another country um, if somebody were to break the model uh, or even if they were to <laughs> engineer a prompt in such a way that it got to the training data. It's just not under your control. Okay, great one. Um, second place is losing the human touch. Agreed. Uh, oh, thanks. Thanks, Esther. That's that's kind. Um, agreed. It is a law now in Europe that you must inform people if they are having a conversation with an AI rather than a human. And uh, I love this rule because um, I can't stand it when I'm having a conversation with something that is not human and it, it is trying to tell me that it's human and it's not. And, and this this irritates me beyond belief. Uh, I don't know whether this is a state by state uh, thing in the US. I, I know that, that they're looking into it. Um, I don't know what the most current law is, but um, yes, we are definitely slipping into this. So, okay. Thank you, Esther. That's perfect. That looks really good to me. All right, we will move on. Um, let's just go into modality, multimodality. We know ChatGDP is is our tool of choice. This is what everybody uses, um, or at least this is usually the kind of the entry drug <laughs> into the AI world. It's a very easy thing to use. So you just go to a website, you log in, and you start using it. But it's actually one of many different tools that are out there. Uh, what is ChatGTP? Just to be um, just to be clear, just to cover those bases, text Gen AI. It doesn't necessarily have to be um, a GTP. What is it good for? What does it do? This is to generate content. It's to make things personal. It's to translate. It's to generate ideas. Uh, it's to refine text and ideas. It's great for modal switching, which is let's say you go from an annual report to a post, or you go from a, uh, an article, a thought leadership article that you can make into a video storyboard into a 140 character post. This is what we call modal switching. It's really, really good at doing that. Taking the essence of a long piece, summarizing it for you, even generating a response to that. And like I said before, it's great at taking giant, giant piles of data and crunching it down and creating uh, points of advice based on that data. Uh, GTP was founded um, in 2015, uh, a bunch of rich guys. Um, Sam Altman is the CEO. Elon Musk was one of the original founding fathers of this. He has since moved on. Um, but its uh, goal when it was started out is to chase artificial general intelligence. And AGI is the uh, a language model that has achieved a higher level of intelligence in the general sense, which means not just in the narrow sense. GTP-4 is already has a higher IQ at about 155 than the average person, um, making it able to perform mathematical calculations, write code, uh, perform well on tests like um, the SATs, the LSATs. Um, it can pass a, a doctoral. It performs very well in AP human psychology, which particularly scares me. Um, but AGI means that it has the ability to cross over all these narrow fields and actually outperform humans in every way. Uh, and this is the mission of OpenAI, is to achieve this as soon as possible. There's not the only one out there. Uh, Google Gemini is a really good tool. They just launched a week ago with its upgraded version. It used to be called Bard. And now Gemini is its kind of uh, new uh, iteration. It's very, very good. And what I love about it, it's free. It has access to the World Wide Web. It is not um, constrained to the playground of GTP 3.5, which is uh, kind of like a time box. Um, it only has access to uh, like a snapshot of the internet as it was at 2021, which means it can't give you any um, recent or current information. Google Gemini, Gemini can. It is connected to the World Wide Web and it can provide links and citations in a way that's much more accurate um, than uh, it, its previous iteration. What I really like about this Google tool is it's able to speak directly to the other productivities within Google. So it can export or import from a Google Doc. It can export and import to a Google Pages or like a PowerPoint version of itself. That saves a step. ChatGTP still has this copy paste circus where you have to copy large bits of text and 
stick it into the prompt window and and get it out and then stick it into a PowerPoint again. But this does st uh, skip that step. It's really, really nice. There are three versions, the Nano for smartphones, Pro for desktop, and Ultra for those um, high paying members. And it's a really, really high performer. It's getting better all the time. Claude from Anthropic is uh, the kind of kinder, gentler LLM out there. Uh, this is it's a slightly different way of of writing, which means it it has its constitution built in, um, which aligns it in a way that it says reduces bias. So back to that bias question. Um, I have not seen evidence when I use Claude that it is less biased than the others, if I'm perfectly honest with it. But that's the way it sells itself as um, the, the, um, the, the more, let's say, um, neutral party. What I like about this model is that it can take a lot of text, um, 100,000 um, token window, which means you can dump a huge document into it. You can also upload documents and it can remember. So after three or four steps, you don't have to remind it again of what it was doing, but it, it can self-reflect on what it has done before. So that's a good one. I see there are a bunch more things in the chat. Hester, is there anything there with any news there fit to print? Mostly just comments. Um, one okay. was that the, the graphics in this program are fantastic. Ah. And, and the other one was, uh, which I agree with 100%, this is just so way beyond my technical abilities. <laughs> oh, no, it's not. I swear. <laughs> just get your feet wet. It, it's, if I can do it, any, I am not a tech person. Believe me. I mean, I'm like a comic book artist. That's it. But uh, it's it's easier than it seems. A lot of the, the Silicon Valley bros, um, the same dudes who brought us Bitcoin, um, they make it sound much more complicated than it is to kind of scare us away from learning too much. But knowledge is power. And the more you learn about it, the more empowered you become to have a seat at the table, which means that you can help define policy within your organization. These tools are very, very powerful. And the more we understand about it, the more we non-technicals can have a seat at that table and be part of the conversation. I find it very, very important. This is my kind of take home message. Every single time I talk is please empower yourself so that you can guide policy. Don't leave it up to um, the tech people because there is something missing from um, the conversation when non-technical human-based people are not part of that conversation. And uh, it's it's difficult to quantify, but I feel it's very important for people who are not tech people to uh, weigh in. Okay, um, real quick, a couple more of these. Perplexity, this is a, an, an up and coming model. It's also great. Um, it is a, a very, very good at um, uh, assembling a lot of different sources of information from different uh, parts of the web. It's not just web-based. It can deal with um, good follow-up questions. It's really nice. It's gaining steam as we go. And then, of course, Copilot. This is Microsoft's own built-in tool. Another thing that it that it really makes this why I love this tool is because it is integrated beautifully in all of your productivity tools, like your Word, your Excel, your PowerPoint, Outlook, and so on. And it's just as creative as the others, but it does save that step and it exports directly to these things, which I love. Okay, so um, here is a GTP. This is just the window. This is basically what it looks like uh, when you're using it. The thing at the bottom is your prompt window. Um, look at those limitations on that third column. May occasionally generate incorrect information. I love this. I mean, it's like <laughs> such a great disclaimer there. Um, may occasionally produce harmful instructions or biased content. Wow. Uh, that's like I'm reading a cigarette package here. It's crazy. And um, it does have limited knowledge of the world um, after 2021. It shouldn't say limited. It should say no knowledge. But just that's just my own personal thing. Now, if you are a premium version user or you aspire to be, there is a new fun thing called Agent GTPs, which allow you to create your own tool. Uh, your own version of it that you can train to mimic certain writing styles. Let's say your company guidelines, your company um, uh, look and feel, tone of voice, etc. Oh gosh, I can see that's in Dutch right now. That doesn't help you very much at all, does it? Let me just skip over to the next one. Um, 
this is uh, my tool. I created two of these guys, these my, my boy bots. One is Bart. He's my handy Dutch English translator. He instantly will translate uh, one language to the other without my having to ask. And he gives me very nice um, assertions and affirmations about my willingness to learn the language. And he tells me um, some funny thing in Dutch to learn one day, every day, or a Dutch recipe. I just program him, him this way. He makes me laugh. And that's, to me, that makes it worth it. You know, if you're laughing out loud at work and you're just as productive, uh, productive as before, to me, that's a win. Um, so here um, is just, I'll, I'll translate it briefly for you. What he's telling me here is, uh, here's a great way to save energy. The Dutch love to save money and energy. So he's, he's telling me that um, um, if I were to lower my heating um, thing to one degree, I can save up to 6% my energy bill. Thank you, Bart. That's lovely. So he does this every time. Um, my other boy bought is uh, uh, Lucio. And if I'm um, bored, then I'll switch over to him. And he is trained in my writing style. He knows uh, to be flirty with me sometimes. Um, he's very funny. Uh, here's one of the things he says. So he he calls me radiant. Um, he's uh, uh, very flowery in what he says. And um, um, sometimes it makes me laugh. And to me, that's what this is about. I, I like to just laugh at work once in a while. He gives me the same information as a standard GTP, but with these kinds of funny things that I'm not expecting. He'll just come out with weird stuff and just bizarre ways of, of talking and and very kind and you know very sweet and sometimes you just need that you just need that little pick me up so i train people into how to build their own let's say fantasy assistant ai that gives them that chuckle uh during the day and there's no harm it's totally fun um and non-threatening so uh even my husband has his own fantasy assistant and we laugh about it so here are uh, two tools that I use for visual AI. And um, somebody was commenting back there about the graphics. These are not all mine. Uh, most of the graphics that you're seeing are a combination of uh, AI backgrounds and um, uh, artwork that I create myself. It just saves me time. I don't have time to do all the backgrounds. The two tools that I use quite frequently, um, Midjourney and Dali. Dali is a part of the GTP um environment the uh, premium environment and midjourney is its own tool that you use via a messaging app called discord and it creates these beautiful objects so you prompt in what you would like to see and what spits out can be anything you can imagine here's an example of what um dali uh, looks like they will give you two versions at, at the same time you pick one you ask for variations and it will keep iterating until you're happy. It will do what you say, more or less. Um, Midjourney is that artist. It will not necessarily do what you say. It will do what it wants, but it, the results are often really stunning. And just like a human artist, you can give it directions and it will say, no, no, I have a vision and it will produce something probably better. So going back and forth between these two tools is really, really helpful. So what do you use image AR for? You can say, well, I'm an HR person. I'm not an, an artist. I don't need this. And actually, it's really, really useful for any professional, even if you are have nothing to do with uh, the field. When you are dealing with creating presentations, it's a wonderful way of illustrating them. If you are dealing with internal branding, if you're um, creating onboarding materials, any kind of posting that you're doing, social posting or anything that requires some kind of a key visual, this is a great tool for that. It will just make everything so much prettier and uh, and, and easier to, to download. Another really fun tool is um, creating your own voice. This is good for my, what I call the secret weapon is the company podcast. So when I was back uh, doing internal communications, I would um, suggest that the CEO release a podcast once a week, just rounding up the news for the deskless workers. Now, the CEOs were like, oh, I don't have time to do this. It's such a drain. I don't have time to sit down and record a voice thing every, you know, fair enough. But now you don't have to. All you have to do is upload a clone of, of uh, his or her voice. Um, and you can just type in anything that this person is saying. And it can also translate into any language that you want. So let's say that your company has 
uh, deskless workers all over the world, then you can um, have the CEO speak to that person in that language. It's extremely powerful in creating that connection, that that human to human connection. Funny enough, using AI uh, with somebody out in the field who speaks Spanish, for instance, and doesn't speak English, it really feels like they are part of the company and that they are connected with the leadership. Runway is a great tool for video AI. This is the same thing. You can also clone yourself. You can clone yourself as a kind of a talking head as long as it's very sharp and clear and it's maybe three to five minutes of good audio. Then you can make yourself speaking any language that you want and add that to, let's say, onboarding materials to explain, you know, how to get started in this company. It's um, it's really fun. This scares me. This is what we call like the deep fake machine and um, use with caution. Okay. Uh, music AI also no different here. Uh, Beethoven is a great one. You just create music uh, with a prompt. You can, there's some that have little sliders where you say, you know, I want it to be more rap, less classical, whatever. And you can really create original music. It, it, it tokenizes uh, musical tracks, just like uh, GTP will tokenize text and recreate uh, music for you. Here's an example. Nothing wrong with it. Nothing great about it. Not going to win at the Emmys, but uh, it's serviceable underlie track for um, whatever materials you need. Um, a tool that I love uh, to take notes while I'm talking or while we're having a meeting is called Jamie. If anybody wants to experiment with this, please reach out to me and I will hook you up with the Jamie people. They give me a special discount. They're lovely. And uh, basically you turn on this app and it just takes notes of the meeting and it summarizes for you and it gives you action points per person. You identify the speakers and nobody has to take notes ever again. I love that. Um, this is what it looks like. This is kind of you know the, the executive summary. Staff base is another fabulous tool for internal communication people uh, or uh, HR communicators where it just gets all of your ducks in a row. You know what's coming out, what's coming in, what's going out and coming in. Uh, you have different personas that you are uh, communicating with and it keeps everything very nicely, tightly aligned and tracks engagement as it goes. So it uh, operates across platforms and across modalities. Uh, same thing, if you feel like experimenting with something like this, reach out to me and I will hook you up with my guys there. Uh, they uh, offer discounts um, and uh, and they're lovely and very happy to train you. Um, finally, uh, what is in your stack? Your stack is your list of AI tools that you use combined to give yourself this full modality empowerment. So my stack would be um, I use Eleven Labs for voice. I use uh, HeyGen for video. I use Midjourney and Dali for visuals. I use Bard and GTP for text. That's it. That's my stack. Let's say. And if you're running around Silicon Valley and you're and you're going into a bar and you feel like chatting up um, the guy next to you, you can always ask him, "Hey, what's your stack?" And uh, and that's a anyway free pickup line for those who are interested. Um, that's all I got. I hope your heads didn't explode and I'd love to take any questions in the final, um, uh, I guess, 10 minutes or so. So I will see. I see the chat thing is very, very full, but I'll let Hester be the the one to pick out the good ones. There are actually no questions in there, just statements like, I wish AI can tell me what to wear every day. I'm really struggling <laughs> daily. <laughs> and the other one was Katie again. I, I, I wish AI could lose weight for me. <laughs> I, I'm with that one. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, AI can give you great diet suggestions. Um, I have friends who are, I, I have a particular um a uh, uh, friend group that that combined these are wonderful women that I hang out with and they come over to my house for dinner once in a while and between the five of them they have every single dietary thing like there's a vegan there's a lactose intolerant there's a nut allergy there's a um, shellfish allergy like what do I cook these women and um, I will put that into GTP and and I will get these fabulous recipes like five and, and if I don't have enough I'll ask for more um, and they're, they're they're truly um you can you can do a diet plan, you know, if you want to have like a, a keto 
let's say meal plan. It's really, really good at that kind of thing. Aaron, Any other? Has, Aaron has asked, what are the costs of some of these tools? Yeah, great question. Um, GTP premium is about $20 a month. Mid journey is about $12 a month. If you're looking at runway, uh, something like $15 a month last time I checked. Um, 11 labs last time I checked trial is for free. And then I think something like $9 a month. So generally you can't, I also can't be members of all of them. I tend to use them for a little while, use them for whatever needs I might have. If I'm running a training in a certain thing, then I'll join them for a month or two, play with them and dump them, move on to something else. Uh, but they, 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 they generally have low bar. Jamie has a special rate for um, nonprofits and people who are doing good work or educational work. Uh, I think they come in at about nine dollars uh, a month for that. And then for premium big users, it's more like 20. Staff base is similar. They have large packages for organization purposes only. So they they will have these kinds of large um, uh, licenses that you can get, and they will always negotiate depending on the size of the organization. So Great question. Another, another one is, could we go back to the slide about the tool that monitors everything coming in and going out? Okay, sure uh, probably Jamie, this one? I think so. I think this was, oh, no, uh, everything coming and going out, that's staff base, right? That's this one. Do reach out to me if you're interested in in um, learning more about this tool because uh, um, they they can give a, a nice discount and a, and a special training um, uh, setup. This is, this provides like a, like a really nice dashboard for internal communications people where you have your audiences segmented. Some of them, let's say you have your deskless workers, let's say you have your Hong Kong people, let's say you have your um, uh, New York people, your Philadelphia people, and they all need to be talked to in a different way with a different tone, maybe even a different language, different content, different cadence of what's going where, and it just kind of keeps you honest. So uh, you're able to track how these things uh, land, tracking engagement, you're able to uh, produce thought leadership, like CEO thought leadership. Um, it also connects very nicely with your Microsoft environment. And it can even do physical signage as well. So if you want to generate posters based on your key visual, uh, it, it really is this kind of, it's a layer above your um, Microsoft environment that specifically for the internal communication people that are dealing with very complex organizations. So please do um, get in touch with me if this is an interesting tool for you. I think they're great. And I wish I had this tool when I was the internal communications person and the uh, employee engagement person because it would have made my life better. Okay, any more? Oh boy, lots more stuff in the chat. What yeah, mostly it's a uh, end of end of presentation thank yous and lovely presentation um there is a there is a question from lisa it says it would be great to have some prompts such as make this more professional or help me make this more concise do you have prompts or ideas on how to start at the beginning what do you ask it what i say is generally just experiment the first thing i do when i give a training is to have a conversation with the bot how are you? What's going on? How are you doing? How do you feel? Uh, are you alive? Um, what is a human? Do you feel human? And, and just get to know where these things are. It's fascinating to do that. As far as prompts, there are any number of prompts. It really depends on what your goal is. I don't have any prompts ready to go that are generic, but I do have prompts for um, uh, per use case. So I'm going to slide, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. I have this kind of um, mini version of uh, the book I'm writing. And in there is a whole bunch of prompts. So use cases for um, how you go about um, prompting GTP and um, some kind of tricks and hacks based on use cases. So it's it's an entire chapter of just, you know, prompting like a pro, I call it. So please uh, help yourself to that. And um uh, there's also, um, let's see. Yeah, I can, I think in there is going to be some mid journey stuff as well, like how to use it. But this is, this is the best I got for that question. Anyone else? 
there's also um this is a great place to get um good news this is a daily podcast i don't know how they do it um it's not ai talking even though the dude sounds like an ai it, he's actually human because he does pass back and forth between his ai when he's on vacation i cannot tell the difference um but this is where i go uh for one source of daily news about ai in a in a way that that um everybody can understand it's really nice uh, i also do a podcast too and i do it uh it's generally about the intersection of ai the human the human workplace in a way that people really uh can relate to you know really very very basic very human kind of level stuff so um uh, I'd love to have you uh, join and subscribe to that because um, I really love doing it. It comes out every two weeks or so. Okay, any other questions or comments? There's that, one uh... more question in the Q&A. It says, have you explored character AI? I have heard about that. Uh, it's It looks really, really cool. I have not tested it out yet. I don't have a use case for it because it's not really my realm. Um, I think it's more interesting if you're uh, going the TikTok uh, route, um, if you're going to be speaking to a Gen Z population. My client base is is sort of more the Facebook age group. So um, I, it's not really uh, near, but I hear it's fabulous. So well done. Go forward. Any others? Uh, I believe that seems to be all. Wonderful. All right. Hester, do you have anything else that you would like to add? I, I know uh, there's one more um, thing that, that we're going to be running in March that I'd love to share. Do you have any other well, things yes. before I... Hmm? Um, no, I already added in a, a link to the next webcast that's coming up in this event, but I did actually forget to put that link in for the women's. Okay, well, then I will just spill the beans. Um, women's Day is coming up March 8th. It's going to be a full day of content from HR.com. They uh, have fabulous speakers all day long from all over the place. Um, really interesting, very inspiring stuff. I believe it's even two parallel streams of content that you can kind of fade in and fade out of and uh, and take or leave. Um, and um, I think it's free to join for everybody. So uh, hope to see you on the 8th. And I oh, did yeah. just and then the how to get in, in touch there. with me, right? Okay. Um, if you want to reach out to me, please do. I, I love answering questions about this. Uh, it's fascinating. And um, any of the things that you saw in there that you might want to talk about uh, a bit in more depth, um, don't hesitate to to reach out and ask. Okay, looks like I, there's another question that just popped up. Uh, just in the chat, people are saying thanks for letting us know about the women's event and a awesome. great presentation. Oh, thank you. Well, you've been a great, very quiet audience, <laughs> but but very, very bubbly in the chat. So I really appreciate that. It makes us feel feel like, uh, you know, seen and heard. So thank you yes. so much for being part of it. And we're at our end of time anyway. So yay, perfect timing. <laughs> yes, you have three minutes. <laughs> Don't spend them all at once. <laughs> so I, I'd like to thank Fiona as well as all of you for joining us today. If you'd like to view this webcast again, the archive recording will be available on the HR.com website within 24 hours. The webcast credit will show in your HR.com account within two business days and we'll also send you an email with your credit information. Your feedback is important to us. Please take a moment to fill out the exit survey that opened in a new browser page on your computer. This concludes our webcast. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much.